Nazis controlled the United States since 1935. In 1935, my father was in the New Orleans French Quarter when Nazis pretending to be Jews murdered the Creoles of New Orleans who had built New Orleans out of the swamp. He told me these Nazis pretending to be Jews had all the weapons of World War II, but the people of New Orleans had only World War I weapons. This was led by Morris Kirschman. At one point, the Louisiana National Guard showed up and took the U.S. citizens who were left alive in trucks to pits that had already been dug. The men shot the men in the head, the women shot the women in the head, and the children shot the children in the head. My father said he saw ship after ship with Nazi insignia going up the Mississippi River. These Nazis then spread across the U.S., killing entire families who mostly lived on individual homesteads, taking their lives, their identities, their land, and their valuables. I know where many of these mass graves are and have contacted the FBI, all the U.S. Senators, many congressmen, and most of the U.S. press, yet no one even comes to get the details or investigates. My father told me everything that happened by the time I was five. By age eight, he told me to spend my entire life finding out everything I could about these Nazis and one day reveal what I had found out. I am revealing that now on YouTube. I'm going to give you the most significant details as all the information I gathered would literally take weeks to tell if not months. I was invited to a dinner by a girl I knew who wanted me to escort her in 1971. The dinner turned out to be with Nazis. The dinner was at, unknown to me beforehand, Carlos Marcello's house. Carlos Marcello was the real godfather from the movie of the same name who ran the whole country of the United States from Louisiana. Carlos Marcello knew my father, Milton Valer Sr., and all about my grandfather, Jonathan Valer who was assassinated in 1918. That is the legacy I was born into. The dinner at Carlos Marcello's included a large number of people who asked me nonstop questions such as, what would you do if someone tried to kill your father? The man who was leading the conversation at that dinner was the then unknown Al Pacino. I was invited to the dinner because my father had taught me all about the tactics of the mafia as a way to keep me from falling into the Mafia way of life. During that dinner, I coached Al Pacino and the cast and crew for the soon-to-be filmed movie, The Godfather. Pacino sat on my immediate left. Francis Ford Coppola sat on my immediate right. A skinny, weaselly-looking Robert De Niro sat across the table a little to my right, and Diane Keaton was also across the table from me. As Pacino told me later, the entire film was rewritten at that dinner with my help, and many specific lines of The Godfather came from my lips. Pacino told me people had come to him and told him he was really German, not Italian. He said he always thought he was Italian, but these people, whom he did not identify, showed him pictures of his father in an SS uniform. He said he couldn't even pronounce his real German name. He said these people told him they would make him a big star. He went on to say he murdered a man to get his start on Broadway by taking the dead man's role. He said they gave him a gun and told him to shoot the man in the back of the head. He did as he was instructed and they came and disposed of the body. There should be a missing persons report on this murdered man. He also said the man's money wound up in his bank account. Pacino acknowledged that Robert De Niro was also German and acquired his name in the same murderous fashion as Pacino. He also told me a man named Chuck would be a senator from New York one day if he played his cards right. Sounds like Chuck Schumer. Outside, after the dinner, in front of the cast and crew who gathered in front of us, Pacino told me they had made an audio recording of the dinner. They used this recording as a guide to make the movie The Godfather that was filmed the next year. I know people have heard portions of the tape, including my father. I was not paid or credited for my part in creating that classic film. Only Marlon Brando was not present. And as Pacino said after the dinner, they were now going to make an entirely different movie than before after talking to me at this dinner at Carlos Marcello's. Outside, Pacino said in front of the cast and crew that they should kill me as a good way to start the movie. But Carlos Marcello shook his head no. During the course of that night, Pacino made it clear that all the Italians in New York were murdered and their identities taken by Germans. 
and all the Dutch who owned Manhattan, which they called New Amsterdam before World War II, he mentioned Dutch in the steel, a phrase I was not familiar with at the time. I've come to find out what that phrase means. The Dutch in America were rounded up as if they were going to be protected by police and military and shipped to Pennsylvania where they were thrown into the molten steel. The steel was used to make tanks, bullets, and grenades for the war to come. The American tanks were made to blow up when hit by German artillery, killing everyone inside. But the steel was too strong. The German artillery damaged the tanks, but they did not blow up. A message was sent from the German conducting the war to the U.S. asking if there was anything different about the steel. The answer came back, Dutch in the steel. This made the steel stronger, the bullets stronger, and the grenades stronger as well. The Dutch helped win the war by dying this gruesome death. Their DNA can still be found in steel from World War II. You can look at the map that has been published that shows Germans occupy two-thirds of the U.S. You can find this map on the internet by looking up Map of the U.S. by Ethnicities. The descendants of German Nazis control all the important organizations in the U.S., like the entertainment industry, such as Hollywood, the universities, the medical schools, the banking system, and occupy most of the important positions of government, both state and federal. They, are bringing, they have been bringing people into the U.S. who pay $1 million a person and they sell law degrees, medical degrees, and even entry into Hollywood. Leonard Behrens, a lawyer in Metairie, Louisiana, who I was working, using for legal work, told me one day that he is not a real lawyer. He said his parents paid $1 million for them and his brother Howard to come into the country from Germany. He said they got on a U.S. military transport in Dusseldorf, Germany, and landed at Dover Air Force Base in Dover, Delaware. At Dover, they were given U.S. passports from the U.S. passport office, not fakes, birth certificates from New York State Hospital, and Social Security cards. He went on to say that Barron's is not his real name, but was given that name and told to tell people he was Russian. He told me he paid for his law degree and never attended law school. He also said his parents were gunned down on the streets of New York for stealing from their criminal partners in Germany. Ken Jung, someone I did stand-up comedy with in New Orleans, told me he was brought into the U.S. from South Korea in the same fashion as a baby by, in his words, his criminal father, who also paid $1 million each for the same passport and birth certificate that the Barron's family had gotten. Jong, who became a doctor, said he could have just paid for his medical degrees, but he wanted to be a real doctor, so he attended medical school. He also wanted to be in show business and was allowed to become a movie and TV star. He has been seen in the Hangover movies and is currently on TV in the show Community. A boy I went to school with, grammar school with, Craig Cabral, said his father came in from Brazil in the same fashion and paid for his law degree. Craig also paid for his law degree and became a lawyer and currently practices in New Orleans, Louisiana today. Craig also had a warrant put out for my arrest for trying to reveal this information. I spent five days in jail before the matter was dropped. The last thing Craig needed was for me to show up in court and reveal this information publicly. However, the plan was to have someone kill me in jail, but I was not arrested in New Orleans, as Craig had planned, but San Antonio, Texas, where I was visiting. I attended California State University in Long Beach, California. There I was working on a bachelor's degree in English literature. I looked at the school catalog and saw that I could get a second degree in film by staying in school one more year. For one thing, I had been allowed to take some advanced film courses. When the faculty found out I was going to get a degree, they wanted to make sure I did not get that degree from the university in film, as only hand-picked hand individuals like Barons, Jong, and Cabral were allowed to get advanced degree from any university. A classmate of mine had come over to uh, had me come over to his apartment and told me I would not graduate from that school with that degree in what then was radio TV. I only had one semester left and told him I couldn't believe how I could not graduate. He went on to tell me that Steve Hubbard, a film teacher there, told him to tell me that John Bellucci wanted to meet me. He told me he was staying at the Chateau Marmont off Hollywood Boulevard by the Hollywood Bowl. He told me to go walk around the hotel and Bellucci would come out to meet me and talk to me. 
I asked this guy why Professor Hubbard, Hubert, Hubert, H-U-B-B-E-R-T, didn't tell me this himself, or want to go with me to meet Bellucci. He didn't have an answer. I thought, I thought this was all too strange and did not go. John Bellucci was dead the next day. It is no coincidence that Robert De Niro was, Robert De Niro was there the night Bellucci died. If I had gone, I am sure I would have been dead as well and probably blamed for Bellucci's death. After that, I found out I was being poisoned at California State University uh, at a sandwich place on campus. When I was given the sandwich, uh, a friend of mine was standing by me. He took it from me and threw it in the garbage, asking me, didn't you see him put something in your sandwich? I hadn't, but when you're being drugged, you tend not to notice things. He told me, I'll pay for another sandwich and watch the guy make it. He went on to tell me he heard I was acting strange, and this is why he came to see me. My eyes would roll back in my head as I learned, later learned from this substance they were putting in my food. And he thought something like this was going on, as that is, he said, common in California, that type of thing, putting things in people's food, like Bill Cosby. I was unable to finish that last semester and barely made it home to New Orleans. A couple of months later, two people from the university came to my parents' house in New Orleans looking for me. They went through my parents' house and my parents were elderly. One of the men was a TV engineer for the school's TV classes and the other was from the university television station run by a man named Larry Hedman. I had worked for him before he fired me for incompetence from being the poisoning and my eyes rolling back in my head. They told my father they wanted me to come back to school and finish and that they would pay for everything. My father told them to come back in a couple of days and I would be there. We talked it over and we both agreed that the only reason they wanted me to come back was so they could kill me. My father had some friends of his waiting for these guys when they came back and they didn't stay long. My understanding is they have used and are still using this poison developed by the US Navy and can cause someone to be suggestible and even giving, giving them a stroke if enough is administered. It looks like table salt. I was later told they had given me so much of this stuff I should have been dead. It took me about two years to recover. Aren't there any people willing to put a camera and microphone in front of Al Pacino, Robert De Niro, Francis Ford Coppola, Diane Keaton, or James Kahn? And ask them about David Valair and the dinner at Carlos Marcello's house in 1971. What about putting a microphone and camera in front of Steve Hubert, who is still at Cal State Long Beach? Or Larry Hedman? Or Robert Finney, who was the chairman of the film department when I went to Cal State, asking him about poisoning David Valair and the murder of John Belushi? Or put a camera and a microphone in front of my half-brother Milton Valair Jr.? Or my half-sister Rosalyn Corrette, who both live in Lacombe, Louisiana, as they both know all about these things? And TV shows I wrote as a child, including Star Trek. My brother Milton is the one who told people I was secretly with my father creating a science fiction show. Milton stood right there when I was forced to give all the details of Star Trek to people from Hollywood. Ask him about the TV show Get Smart and Mission Impossible as well, also created by me. Someone who breaks the story open will be famous overnight and will not have to kill anyone or be sexually abused, which is common in all universities, medical schools, and in Hollywood. Homosexuality is what all these Germans in the U.S. have in common, and they also molest all the little boys they can get their hands on to turn them into homosexuals, when these children are too young to know what they're doing. They molest little girls as well, which essentially turns them into sex slaves when they grow up, and accounts for all the women in the U.S. who go into pornography. As I've come to find out, Germans are incestuous and homosexual by culture. This is the reason there is so much homosexuality in the United States and other Western countries. This is what they call the master race, everyone having sex with everyone. Otherwise, unless you are related to the Germans who took over the U.S., like Al Pacino, you are not one of them, as they put it, and you are not allowed to advance in any career in the U.S., or they kill you. I have been poisoned by these people and they have tried to kill me a number of times trying to make it look like an accident. I have been very lucky. I have contacted the FBI repeatedly who have done nothing. This is why I am outside the United States now and unless I am forced to return, I will never go back to the U.S. again. This is the basic story of the Nazi takeover of the United States. 
where you will find no descendants of any of the founding fathers whose descendants have all been murdered by these psychotic Germans. <laughs>